historic day for Fernando Alonso, who crosses the line for his fifth Grand Prix victory of the season. He crawls across the line. It's the sixth win for him in only 59 Grand Prix starts. Yes, Fernando, you've won the big five already, and this is only the tenth Grand Prix of the year. Here's Flavio Briatore holding up five fingers. Fernando Alonso does that after every win, although you do have to wonder what he'll do if he gets past ten. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us as we count down to the British Grand Prix at midnight. One of the highlights... We'll have a look at qualifying in a moment. Sorry, stop in the championship. It is, Jeff. It's special because most of the teams are based around there, and it's also historic. 1950, the first of the modern uh, Grand Prix was held there, first of the season. Unfortunately, with historic comes uh, ancient, and the, perhaps the facilities aren't quite as good as Silverstone as they should be, but they're trying to modernise it, but it's still an iconic Grand Prix. Great and place. with the corners like Beckett's and Cops as well. It's the fast-flowing circuit, and this, you know, this, this sort of circuit, like Spa, is what the, the cars were actually built for, and they do a lot of testing here so that they know this circuit pretty well. And it's, um, it is a great circuit. It should never disappear from the calendar, never. The weather... ...with some of the... It's warm, quite pleasant. This is Silverstone, <laughs> England, you yeah. found, wasn't it? This is not the Silverstone we know. <laughs> uh, usually raining, but no, it's, it's actually very pleasant. Um, no threat of anything. And when you look at the sort of circuit Silverstone is, McLaren expected to do there, will do well there, but... Another but, just the same as last week. Um, the engine let them down, except it wasn't really the engine this time. It was a scavenge pump, which takes the oil around the engine, that sort of thing, which failed, and... Doing pretty well. Jeff, I shouldn't really tell you this, but the <laughs> computer projection is first Montoya, second Alonso, third Raikkonen. Just trying to work out how a computer could possibly predict what Montoya is going to. <laughs> Pushing him down the grid. That happened last week. At For British fans, what that means is that there will be a local driver on the front row. A big weekend for Jensen Button. There's a great deal of speculation about his future, whether confirm nor deny mode. Certainly he's coming into good form. Fourth place in France last week. Tonight he starts his home Grand Prix on the front row. McLaren's Kimi Raikkonen actually recorded the second fastest time, but for the second week in a row, he's been is such an advantage, especially as Fernando Alonso is well placed to take another step towards the World Championship after a week where he constantly talked down Renault's chances. Jensen Button too, surprised quite um, I think we can do some pretty good things from there. It's not the ideal situation again, but uh, it's nothing what I can do. I just can drive as quickly as I can. It's Uh, for sure, it's not the uh, it's not the way to try to win the championship. If you take every time ten places penalty, so we're not that quick <laughs> in the end to to give so much uh, to the other guys. The car this morning felt much much better than yesterday. The the team did a, a incredible job the, last night uh, with some different changes we did, and uh, the car quite quick this morning. So I was uh, P1 in uh, in the last session and in P4. So. You know, I think uh, uh, we were uh, in qualifying very confident, but uh, probably not uh, that confident to, to get the pole. So Alonso on pole, you have to feel for Raikkonen, he's points behind Alonso, but he's had a, a suspension failure at the Nürburgring. No points at Indianapolis, of course, like Alonso, and the engine failure in practice in France last week. So Bob, what's the feeling in the McLaren camp? Is it the way he's driving the car? Well, I don't think it can be, Jeff, to be honest, because a scavenge pump is not affected by performance. It's just one of those things that breaks. So um, they've, they've adjusted the strategy a little bit. He's carrying 10 kilos more fuel than Montoya, so that will give him another couple of laps, probably. I understand that Button is quite light, they think, but Alonso is the one that you have to worry about up front. What about Kimi and the way he's feeling? I mean, if you listen to him talk, it's impossible to tell whether he's happy or disappointed. <laughs> it's just the same. <laughs> just the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I understand. I talked to Mark Arnold his trainer is he's the guy if you see standing near uh, Kimmy there's a guy with 
bald head. Uh, Mark said that Kimmy is not best pleased with this. He's getting a little annoyed, a little tetchy about it, which you've got to understand, you know, 10 places every year on two races. Winner. Round 11 of 19. Let's just run through the championship tables. Alonso has 69 points and pole tonight. But Bob, it's interesting. Alonso has the Renault. Huh? Strange, isn't it? From Fisichella's really, really good start to the season in Australia, he's sort of faded away a little bit. And um, Alonso is just like a train at the moment. But you need this sort of... He's there by dint of Indianapolis, so you could really um, take him off a little Close bit. Close enough, though, if Alonso or Raikkonen slip up. Absolutely. I mean, but he is starting from 10th place tonight. He's obviously not quick. The car's not quick. Very challenging in front of him. It's interesting. Right, let's just have a look at the Constructors' Championship as well. Renault leading by 18 points. And Ferrari. That total artificially inflated by what happened in America. Why do you think Bob Ferrari has lost its competitive advantage this year? I think, Jeff, these things happen. Uh, why did, did McLaren fall off the perch and Williams fall off the perch all those years ago? It's a combination of tyres. The car this year, interestingly, is not designed by Rory Byrne, the, the guy that's designed it in the last few guy called Aldo somebody rather can't remember his name so Rory has tried to come in and help the car uh, out a little bit so perhaps it's that all you need is one tiny thing to be different and you and you you're not performing as well well Aldo may not be back again next year the way it's going <laughs> when you think about Silverstone and we were talking about this before it's impossible to get away from the sense of history it hosted the first Formula One race in 1950 now when you read about those days or listen to Bob's stories about when he was there 55 years ago, it's like a different world. And so it is with driver safety. Safety and attitudes towards it have changed so much over the years. The daredevils of past motor racing days. Tough as old leather. Proper protective measures for the drivers, not a trace. But severe injuries and fatal accidents all ground over the course of racing history. Good for the drivers nowadays. Full head-to-toe protection. The helmet alone is by no means everything. A tight fit, body hugging, supporting and mandatory for all the teams since 2003, the head and neck support system, or HANDS for short. HANDS is an additional protection for the head and neck. It consists of a carbon fiber collar which is connected to the safety belts and the helmet. In the case of an accident, especially a frontal collision, the system is intended to prevent over-twisting of the spine, over-stretching of the neck muscles, and also an impact of the helmet on the steering wheel. To begin with, some drivers resist the protective neck support, but today the advantages have prevailed. prepared for anything thanks to individual optimum protection the basic requirement for a strong performance safety as always the paramount issue in motorsport although i do see the hunts device does offer yet another sponsorship opportunity safety is where it all started at the brickyard three weeks ago formula one doing its best to move on from that but questions still remain over any punishment for the michelin equipped teams we have to wait until september to find out what is going to happen there speaking of questions let's get to the ask bobs for this week our first question comes from brian meeklejohn the question bob is what are the strips on the ground that the cars stop on when they come in for a pit stop what do they do? Uh, well, Brian, there is quite a simple job, really. They just uh, insulate the car, if you like, or at least take the earth or the possibility of any static electricity um, causing a fire in the car. So it's the, very much the same as a fuel tanker filling up at a gas station. They always earth the, the um, fuel tanker or the Bowser or something like that. That's all they're doing in Formula One. That strip goes all the way back into the garage to an earth uh, pole, and it simply means that there's no static electricity buildup that's going to cause a fire. Still haven't got used to those pit stops where the cars come in and they don't change the tyres. Now, our second question comes from Richard Adams. Can you explain to me, please, how the points tables are worked out? 
Um, yes, Richard, it's quite easy, really. The, the points uh, systems have been changed much over the last few years. There were, there were years where it was nine points to win, only down to sixth place, where you had to give away your two worst um, results. There. And it's 10, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 for the top eight finishes. The constructor's table is both your cars finishing in the points. You get both the, the points. So if you've got a first and a second, you're getting 10 for your first driver and 8 for the second one. So the constructor's is 18 points, and each driver gets individual points. That's as simple as it is, until they change it again, of course, and which could happen any moment. <laughs> <laughs> and our third and final question comes from another Richard, and that question is, when the engines change from V10 to V8, how will that affect the weight requirements for the cars? Well, Richard, um, obviously, if you go to a smaller engine, it should affect the weight. But um, in the FIA regulations that have just been announced for 2008, it says the weight of the car will be specified. In other words, they've left a, a hole there that they can lift the weight up or down. They want to change the basic weight of the car anyway because they want to change the use of um, heavy ballast on the car and heavy ballast is obviously something that's dangerous in an accident so they want to actually change the weight anyway but V8, V10 to V8 obviously it will make a difference whether it makes a difference to the FIA or not is another matter and I don't know what the minimum weight will be in that case. All right well we'll have three more questions for Bob in the build-up to the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim in a fortnight. July such a busy month four races in five weeks also at Silverstone this evening New, Ze New Zealand driver Fabian Coulthard was the guest driver in the Porsche Supercar race I can tell you he came home 10th pretty tough to step into a series as a guest driver when everyone else has been hard at it all year right now a chance for you to get into the grandstand for the Australian Grand Prix at the end of March next year Nescafe are giving you the chance to win a trip for two to the 2006 Melbourne Grand Prix the prize includes airfares four nights accommodation and spending money plus every round you'll go in the draw to win an F1 racing magazine subscription to enter, simply answer the following question. The 2003 British Grand Prix was interrupted because of a mad monk on the track, a horse on the track, a rainstorm, or a protest march on the track. Text your answer A, B, C, or D to 3777 on your mobile. And for more chances to win, visit tvnz.co.nz. Keyword, Ask Bob. Take the Nescafe Grand Prix Challenge. The Australian Grand Prix, what a prize that is at the end of March next year. Now we're counting down to the British Grand Prix, a race that nine months ago hung in the balance because Silverstone's owners failed to meet Bernie Eccleston's asking price to stage it. Fortunately, that was all sorted. Eccleston once described Silverstone as a country fair masquerading as a world event. Well, let's get a sense of what it's like to go through corners like Beckett's and Cops. In recent years, the Silverstone circuit has often been a topic of discussion, not because of its tradition, but because safety shortcomings meant that racing here was set to end. But the drivers think differently, as the race calendar would definitely be the poorer because England and the English have a very long motor racing tradition, and most of the teams are based in England. I'd therefore be against dropping the race. <laughs> The track's trickiest elements have always come from above. Typical British weather often means rain, with the otherwise good grip then lost and the asphalt getting very slippery. Another challenge presents itself in the fast corners, especially Beckett's. Well, there's a big crosswind uh, or headwind or tailwind. Any, any direction the wind is going uh, affects the cars heavily through that section because it's very exposed. Like I said before, there's no, no real shelter. The wind can come through there and, and hit the cars quite hard, which the drivers feel a lot because we are uh, at very high speed. We're doing um, you know, about 250, 240 kilometers an hour into the Beckett section, and it's very, very uh, demanding to get the right balance. And when the wind is moving around, it upsets us a little bit. We defy all of the different winds around Beckett's. We'll have to stay alert. The car can have a tendency to understeer. It's flat out ahead with a quick look in the mirror to see how the competition are doing. We're going over 300 kilometers per hour, absolute top speed. Then it's into the next section with lots of feeling. Only with the perfect line will we achieve top performance. Overtaking is pretty difficult on this circuit due to a lack of slow corners at the end of long straights. A lot of fast corners where it's hard to keep close to the car in front. Now comes the last third. 
This slower section requires a lot of delicate footwork. You've got to give just the right amount of throttle and choose the perfect points to break. Then we're in the stadium complex. The next two left-handers offer good chances to overtake, with the second of these rounded in second gear at just 80 kilometers per hour. Then it's the final spurt. The last two corners exciting but uh, good for the fans again because the cars are a little bit slower and they get to see them and sometimes we're locking a wheel up and sometimes we're trying a little bit hard so that's when you get to see the the big mixture of Silverstone whether it's at Beckett's it's very very fast and cops the first first few corners and the last part of the lap is slowing down and you have to get technically that is uh, important to get right the last two corners make good those tenths of a second and return to the start finish straight While Weber and Heidfeld might talk fondly about Silverstone, it's not helped them in qualifying. Weber will start 11th, Heidfeld 14th. Such are the problems that Williams are having that Red Bull's David Coulthard has expressed concern that Weber will hold him up. So, Bob, what is going wrong at Williams? I don't know, and it's even it looks even worse, Jeff, because um, Heidfeld is using last year's car, effectively the 27, whereas uh, Weber is in this year's car with extra aerodynamic packages on it to help it go. And look at the difference, it's, it's virtually nothing. It's six, seven tenths of a second or something like that between them. No, no, it's only two tenths of a second. It's ridiculous. I don't know the, the real reason, but they've had a lot of trouble with aerodynamics leaving and all sorts of things lately. There's a lot of unhappiness in the camp between BMW and Williams as well, political, and that sort of makes it uneasy and, and the feeling in the camp is uneasy and all sorts of things happen then. Williams also involved in this gossip about Jensen Button possibly going to Williams, staying with BAR, possibly going to Ferrari. Well, going to Ferrari as well, because if, um, if they have a change of engine, then Button can actually, usually it's written into contracts that you can get out of your uh, deal straight away. Now, if Ferrari call him, although he'll be a year as second to... Um, to Schumacher, I bet you he'd prefer to go to Ferrari than Williams at the moment. But not helping by refusing to confirm or deny? No, but it's good but publicity, you isn't it? You would, wouldn't you? <laughs> Ferrari called, you're not going to tell them everybody they didn't, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, while we're talking about Jensen Button, he has had the opportunity to try out the new Grand Prix circuit in Turkey, the Grand Prix race there on August 21. Now, these are his thoughts as he takes us around the latest Formula One racetrack. This is going to be a very tough corner. Um, circuit's running away from you here. You're going to get a lot of understeer and then a lot of oversteer when you get onto the power. Up through the gears, through turn two. It's going to be full speed through here. Head onto the mill. Up the hill. Over the crest into turn three, which will be hard on the brakes while you're mid-air, probably, going over the brow. Um, comes up on you very quickly. Left hand corner, second gear. Being careful not to run too wide because you've got a, another second gear corner which is a tight right, which runs down the hill. Runs down the hill into a, another tight left. Um, probably a little bit quicker than the last two, probably third gear. Dab on the brakes on the way through here, trying to balance the car. And then it's just gaining speed all the way to the exit here. You probably won't even get near the second apex of that double, a, double apex corner. Down the hill. Hard on the brakes into a right-hander, which is um, cambered on the way in and a little bit off-cambered on the exit, which is going to probably cause a little bit of oversteer. Again, um, very early apex. On the power, um, up the hill here, over another crest. Well, this one's a bit more exciting after this crest. We go into a, a very, very long left-hander, which is pretty much going to be one big corner. Supposedly three apexes, but it'll be one big corner. So through the first apex, um, you're going to be very, very close to full power here. Just balancing the car throughout. Try not to get too much understeer or too much oversteer. Just trying to be into a sharp left-hander, trying to get, get as smooth as exit as possible because you go through this little little corner here, which again, full speed. Gaining power all the way up here, gaining speed, and then you're down into the supposedly Eau Rouge section, which is a, a fast right-hander, going to be easy flat, I think. Um, 
car should be very, very stable through here. <laughs> Over another brow, um, going to be reaching close to 200 miles an hour probably over that, probably 2, 205 on braking into the slowest section on the circuit, which is the last three corners. Not the most exciting corners, but I know they have to put them in. <laughs> um, a lot of overtaking into here. Uh, there's enough runoff if you make an it, which you, if you make a mistake. An equally slow right, which for me is quite pointless. And then uh, you've got the last corner of the circuit, which is reasonably wide. Uh, and, uh, here we are, back on the main straight. It does take a bit of imagination to see how it will be. Track that runs anti clockwise. Imola and Interlagos are the other two that run that way. Bob, your impressions of that racetrack? Well, that's the first time I've seen it, Jeff, and I think the. Um, I like the elevation changes. That's quite good. I'm not quite. Because you go right and you're up the hill. Um, but the elevation changes look good, and they look to be some very fast corners, but as Jensen said, it also looked a, a bit. Um, some corners there as well. You can't really tell with him driving a uh, four-wheel drive around concrete trucks, can you? I guess it'll change a little bit. What about any decent overtaking opportunities? Well, there looked to be at least two or three there on the faster corners and then coming the, the heavy braking into the sharp left-hander that he was talking about there. That's a good opportunity, but um, I don't know. If it's a Herman Tilke circuit, he must have learned from all his other ones now. He's the guy that's done Malaysia and China and all those ones. So he knows where he's I'm not saying gone wrong, but where maybe criticism was levelled at him, so he's probably corrected it in this. So I would hope that it would be a fairly, uh, fairly good circuit for racing. Strategy for tonight? Oh, go quickly. Two stops for uh, McLaren and Williams, three probably for BAR. Schumacher, I've no idea. All right, we're just about set to go. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone round 11 of the championship. Fernando Alonso on pole and well placed to extend his championship lead. Let's join our commentators, James Allen and Martin Brundle. Thank you very much indeed, Jim, and a very warm welcome to everybody to a very sunny Silverstone. Beautiful weather, no traffic problems. Silverstone is really losing its charm. Well, it's certainly a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere here. A huge crowd of people here, 100,000 paying spectators, almost 50,000 corporate guests, all crammed into this former airfield in Northamptonshire to see what hopefully will be a tremendous motor race this afternoon. This track, incidentally, recently voted the third most popular amongst race fans all around the world after Monaco and Spa-Francorchamps in Belgium and uh, go agree with that it was as Jim said it always does provide great racing championship the leader Fernando Alonso though perhaps put it most eloquently yesterday when talking of the London bombings when he said sport can only do so much a limited amount really at a time like this to help but what we can do we will do and that is to put on a good show certainly everybody here will say Amen to that. The British public, I have to say, have responded magnificently to the tragic events of Thursday in London. They're here to enjoy themselves. The sun is shining. Let's hope we get a great spectacle. Well, although Alonso and Kimi Raikkonen are contesting the World Championship, we've yet to actually see them go wheel to wheel on the racetrack so far this season. We could well see it here this afternoon. Alonso's on pole and Raikkonen down in 12th on the grid. Might not seem like a likely prospect, but the McLaren certainly has the edge on pace around this racetrack. It won't be like France last weekend where Alonso was able to run away and hide from pole position. Jensen Button, you can see there, keeping British hopes alive on the front row of the grid. After the, one of the very best qualifying laps of his career, he was absolutely made up yesterday afternoon by that lap. He's got fuel in the car. He said to his father, John, there's nothing more I could have squeezed out of this car. And that he has put all the pressure of the week and the media attention and the expectation of the crowd to the back of his mind and went out there and delivered, as did all of the big names in Formula One. So Raikkonen and Alonso, second half of the Grand Prix for sure, Raikkonen will come through. Early part of the Grand Prix, Martin, I fancy that Juan Montoya in the McLaren is going to give Alonso and Button something to think about. So we're looking at a race that could evolve in several phases over the course of the 60 laps here this afternoon. I think there's no doubt about it. Raikkonen's ultimate result this afternoon can be affected by a lot of other drivers in terms of are they going to hold the pack up can he get through them quite quickly can they stay reasonably close to Alonso if Button could get in ahead of Alonso into turn one 
you know, an awful lot of happy people around this racetrack, but I think that would play a key role in this afternoon's race. Also, I think everybody from, say, Sato in seventh through to Clean in uh, Clean Mass, even in 16th, they want to score points this afternoon. They're going to have to hustle, particularly in the early stages of the Grand Prix, to uh, a big yawn, a nervous yawn going on inside that crash helmet there from Juan Pablo Montoya. So I think there's going to be uh, two, uh, two separate races going on, uh, by and large. It's to, for the podium and very much then for the points involving, as I say, the top 16 runners here this afternoon. Montoya must be uh, looking good for a Grand Prix victory here too. Surely he's got more fuel on board than almost anybody else on that grid, other than, I suspect, Kimi Raikkonen. And uh, let's hope we don't see Jensen peeling off into the pits too early for fuel. But he seemed confident. He was so surprised with his pole position. He just put, he's just pushing the McLaren back there so he can lay more rubber down. He'll switch the traction control off, spin the wheels like crazy. It'll be a big uh, plume of blue smoke behind him. But Raikkonen wanting then to uh, give himself the best slingshot. Now, the good thing about the Silverstone grid is it's got equal grip pretty much both sides, certainly more so than uh, many other tracks around the world. You can get an electric getaway from the inside, our left-hand side as we're looking at them there. Well, one of the things that Graikonen's going to have to deal with as we get ready for the parade lap, the heat haze, 45 degrees, the track temperature, and 27, the air temperature. There is Raikkonen is uh, a thing called field spread uh, because it's a very fast racetrack it's a, a single line around a lot of the fast corners as they head off on their parade lap rather slow to react most of the drivers and what that means is the way that the field spreads out as they all filter their way through the single line through beckett's for example stow the fast corners around this racetrack and just looking back to last year over the first 10 laps the car in 12th position was 33 seconds behind the race leader after 10 laps. So if Raikkonen is not able to make an impression to move forward, as Tiago Montero there brings up the back of the field, if Raikkonen can't move forward in the early crucial laps, he's going to find himself 20, 30 seconds behind the race leaders after around 10 or 12 laps. And that will give you the kind of mountain he's going to have to climb from there. So tremendous amount of excitement at all layers throughout this grid. Here's David Coulthard. We haven't really talked very much about him. He had a reasonable qualifying lap yesterday in the Red Bull Racing, powered by the Cosworth engine. Still the only uh, engine maker not to suffer an engine failure during the Grand Prix weekend. They're still following the old 2x2 two two race system. Uh, everybody else has lost one at some point, but uh, Coulthard 13th on the grid and hopeful of some world championship points this afternoon. That you can see is the constructors' table. 24 points the margin between Alonso and Raikkonen going into this Grand Prix. So Alonso will be the championship leader, whatever happens going away from here as uh, Flavio Briatori makes his way back. It's a fast track, Silverstone, 144 miles an hour. The average lap speed, despite one or two slow corners in the final part of the lap. An F1 car covers about a mile every 20 seconds around this racetrack. There is the man with the big responsibility, Charlie Whiting, the FIA's race director. And uh, that's Jensen Button's father, John, who I was mentioning before, with Jules Kopinski just to the left there, just out of frame. And uh, Jensen's personal assistant, a very nervous man, John. He was leaning against the garage wall, smoking a cigarette as I walked up here to come to the commentary box. He's lived it, hasn't he? He's lived every moment from the first kart race and getting up five, six o'clock in the morning, traveling all over the country to uh, watching Jensen on the front row of the grid. Not for the first time, but... Uh, Obviously a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure on Jensen's shoulders this afternoon. Anyway, I was just thinking Raikkonen's best chance, uh, I hate to say this in many respects, but his best chance this afternoon is if uh, Montoya can get up and hustle Alonso too. So uh, but we know how fast that Renault is off the line. Now they're just trying to pump some heat into those rear tyres. I was very surprised how few cars drilled it away from the line. There's a bit of rubber down on the start line from previous races, the GP2 in particular. Kimi Raikkonen having to make his way past a car. It's quite unusual on this lap, but as long as you don't fall to the tail of the field, you can regain a few positions. Takuma Sato seems to be uh, stuck out of position. Indeed he is. He's at the back of the grid. He's not even made it onto the grid hatchings yet, so uh, new situation for this year. Any cars with problems get pushed off the grid. They can then start from the pit lane if they can get the car going. Charlie Whiting is aware of the situation. The car appears to be stuck in gear at the moment. Marshall's running onto the racetrack to he, try and get it to uh, to move. He may have to abort this start, but uh, now he's going for it. He's going for it. 
So, off the start line, turn up the sound and enjoy. 20 Formula One cars go racing at Silverstone. And down to the first corner they fly, and it's edgy, very edgy stuff indeed between the Renault of Alonso and Montoya's McLaren. They're side by side, going down to Beckett's. Montoya is alongside, and Montoya's through. What a great start by the Colombian into Beckett's. Just listen to the crowd. And the Renault drops to second place with Button third. Ferrari there starting very strongly, presuming that's uh, Rubens Barrichello, Fisichella there as well. As they try and get uh, Sato's car out of the way, they're moving very slowly up the pit straight. Here's Kimi Raikkonen making a move on Ralph Schumacher. Already then up to eighth place. What a tremendous start here at Silverstone. Montoya leads, Alonso second, Button third, Barrichello's fourth, fifth is Fisichella, sixth is Trulli, seventh Michael Schumacher, eighth Ralph is Raikkonen, and ninth is Ralph Schumacher. I'd imagine McLaren will now watch and see how quickly Raikkonen can make his way through the field. Michael Schumacher will be his next target and victim, but Montoya doesn't care a jot about that. He's on his way. He's not about to try and back up the pack, is he? Montoya, Alonso Button, Barrichello fourth, Fisichella up to fifth, and they're still struggling to get the, uh, the safety car is out. They've only just got Sato out of the pit straight, and the safety car picked the field up. I wonder if Charlie, he probably couldn't see Sato's car. It was beyond the grid, round the corner. And uh, I, I was a little bit surprised they started the race. He probably also expected them to clear that car a little bit more quickly, but it was an awful long way to push it. And uh, he had to deploy the safety car. That's taken the sting out of it. But of course, they all have to hold position. There is Sato, they'll fire him up. And he's a lap behind already. He's been so unlucky this year. Just in the interest of clarity, Sato's car was pushed through a red gate, which is at the very beginning of the pit straight, underneath the podium, about 10 or 15 seconds before the safety car led the field through. So it was obviously a, a fairly marginal call. It wasn't clear exactly what was going to happen with Sato's car being stuck, as it appeared to be in gear around the corner, out of sight of race director Charlie Whiting. There he is coming down from the gantry. That's why he had to throw the safety car. But I don't think it'll be out for very long. In fact, it's coming in at the end of this lap. And the guy who is most benefiting from this is undoubtedly Kimi Raikkonen. Yeah, Sato there, and I think he stopped, look, there he is at the front of the picture to do a practice start, and uh, this is a replay, the safety car is out, the race is neutralised, but Sato stopped, almost uh, looks as if to do a practice start, which you're not strictly allowed to do as you approach the grid, or any, or any time on the uh, green flag lap, and uh, Charlie will be annoyed, I think, also, that they didn't pull that car back off the racetrack, they could have pulled it back into a little bit of no man's land there, they elected to push it down, the pit straight. Ted, have you got any more news for us? And now more trouble for Takuma Sato. They want to train, change his strategy, fill him up with fuel, but now they can't get the car started. It's in the BAR box. The starter is going, the wheels are in turn, but oh, more trouble for Takuma Sato. Well, that's a bit of a messy start to the uh, British Grand Prix for Sato and for the rest of us there. You can see Juan Montoya leading the Grand Prix. As I said before, the man who most benefits from this is Kimi Raikkonen. Here he is, just behind the Ferrari of Michael Schumacher. He is now in eighth place, and the, the whole, what I was talking about, field spread, it, it's non-existent, basically, when they go across the stuff. It is, but they've got to close up. The safety car is in this lap. The race will, uh, will start again. Montoya becomes the safety car now. He backs the pack up, and um, surely... We know the Bridgestone struggle in these cooler conditions. The drivers are really scared now. Their tire pressures have dropped a few PSI, and they know they're going to have to nurse them. We've seen tire failures. Michael Schumacher had tire failures in Barcelona, and of course we know what happened in Indianapolis. Now they've got to be careful. Well, Montoya's done his teammate a favour. He's backed them right up until the final corner. There is Raikkonen, you see. You're not allowed to overtake until you go across the start-finish line, but Raikkonen crosses the start-finish line, as you can see behind Alonso Button, Barrichello, Fisichella, Trudy Michael. Just three seconds behind him. It would have been more like ten if we hadn't had the safety car. So that's a huge favour to Kimi Raikkonen as they flash through to start the third lap. Yeah, I'm rather surprised. I don't understand why they're not absolutely glued to the gearbox of the car in front, almost as if they're surprised by it. And there, Raikkonen was having a go on the way into Beckett. Didn't make it work out and has lost a little bit of ground as they make their way down to Stowe Corner. Crucial part of the race for Kimi Raikkonen. He has to make up those spaces in the next 10 laps. Well, we heard Rubens Barrichello saying on the grid that he felt that the Bridgestone tyre might come into its own later in the race. That certainly what Michael Schumacher will be hoping as well. Schumacher made a couple of mistakes on his qualifying lap yesterday, which dropped him down to uh, ninth on the grid. 
and now he's got Kimi Raikkonen, here he is, right behind him. And Raikkonen with the, what certainly looked like the fastest car throughout free practice here this weekend. It definitely has the edge, and this is such an important weekend for Raikkonen. He really has targeted it as a must win. This 10 place engine penalty on the grid, a massive setback, but there's a long way to go in this 60 lap Grand Prix for him. Up the front then, Alonso just half a second behind Juan Montoya, not letting the McLaren get away from him too much. As Mark Blundell said at the beginning of the show, it's such a pity that the driver takes that pain of the engine problem. Uh, it's two consecutive weekends. We haven't seen Raikkonen and, and Alonso head to head as they surely would be right now. And uh, we saw Raikkonen really struggling. He wasn't even full throttle through bridge corner in the turbulent air coming off the back of that Ferrari of Michael Schumacher. Well, I was talking to uh, one or two of the drivers and they say that when you follow another car like this, the turbulent air, you can feel it from 100 meters behind as we take another look at the start. Jensen away a little bit tardily on our left-hand side and already Montoya on the offensive. Coulthard got away poorly too at the back of the, uh, to the middle of the field but ended up very near the back of the field. And this is it, this is the shootout down to the left of Maggots into Beckett's corner. And Montoya with a lot more acceleration there suggesting, uh, well, there we go, we're on board with Kimi Raikkonen and what's he gonna make up from P12 on the grid? Looks like he's gonna have Mark Webber before he even gets down to turn one and uh, just stuck with that. And uh, look at that, or full opposite lock, well not full opposite lock, but bundles of opposite lock, and now he's gonna try and have two of them. Did that one work out? That was incredible. Well, he certainly got field nerve, and a little bit later on, we saw him get past Ralph Schumacher on the way down to Stowe Corner, so he could see three cars by the time he got to Stowe on the first half lap for Kimi Räikkönen and took him up to uh, eighth place, where he now is. Well, we saw the Ferrari was very poor through these last two corners, but it's uh, he's always going to be on the throttle a car length later than Michael Schumacher, and uh, they're all so fast down the pit straight. There is no braking zone, really, down into Turn 1, so uh, you've got to be alongside as you head towards the braking zone. Just before we saw that restart, I was mentioning the uh, turbulent air issue. As I say, 100 metres, apparently, you can feel the air being disturbed. These new generation aerodynamics on the cars make it very, very difficult to overtake, particularly through these high-speed corners here at Silverstone. That uh, Beckett's complex, they carry around about 130 miles an hour through the middle of that switchback, left-right change of direction. And it's really very difficult to follow another car through. Bit of a tail out there for Juan Montoya. He's trying to make a break. Alonso is pegging the gap, though. And Montoya took seven tenths out of him, that for last, but... Uh, Alonso has closed him down. He looks like he's setting the fastest sector times at the moment, not wanting the McLaren to get away. And Jensen Button is doing a splendid job as well, holding on in third place with Rubens Barrichello there in the Ferrari in fourth. Did a more solid job yesterday in qualifying than teammate Michael Schumacher, which was the platform from which to mount the assault here today. Raikkonen now nine and a half seconds behind Team Leader. And you can see already that Montoya's having to work a bit on that wheel, isn't he? Yeah, he's, that really surprises me how much the car's sliding all, all around the racetrack, actually. But uh, they're, they're scampering away. I, I, I'm kind of a bit surprised that, uh, although why would Montoya want to play this game? He's got his own race, his own championship. But uh, I expect him maybe to just be backing the pack up a little bit because Raikkonen is now nine seconds adrift and we're on lap six. The field spread you were talking about beginning to develop now James and uh, once again they're stuck behind Trulli. Trulli tends to have a tremendous qualifying pace in the Toyota but not the race pace he needs. He's in the 1 minute 23s, no he's in the 124s actually and he's just backing Michael Schumacher and Kimi Raikkonen right up in 7th and 8th. Yeah, two seconds a lap slower than Montoya and Alonso in front, that's what uh, Trulli is. You're looking uh, from Raikkonen's position forward to Michael Schumacher, and then in front of him again was Jarno Trulli. So Schumacher would also be very, very keen to get past Trulli. It was, uh, he was a factor in the outcome of the French Grand Prix, and I'm slightly surprised because yesterday after qualifying, Trulli was saying, yeah, good lap here, but I do believe, as you can see, Raikkonen get very close to Schumacher there into, uh, I believe, Stowe Corner. There you are. Uh, and uh, they would have called him out. I mean, I think it would have called anybody out. Michael was so slow on the apex, and Kimi had, what, 30 miles an hour more into the apex of the corner, had to get out of it, and ended up running wide. Well, Trilly, shows you how fast he can be when he uh, gets some clear air. Trulli was saying that he thought his race pace would be stronger, but still a couple of seconds a lap slower, so the race developing very interestingly indeed here. Montoya leading Alonso. Jensen Button still in third place.